All right, so I'm going to take it over as a relay, um, and I'm going to talk more about about uh, shifting towards the implementation framework. Uh, next slide. So just as a reminder, prior to this um, test coming to market, we were kind of limited in our HCV diagnostic approaches because everything ultimately ended up with needing to get that laboratory blood draw for a large platform test in a large laboratory for HCV RNA for diagnosis. Next slide. And a real big problem with that was that that entails um, incomplete testing, maybe only getting an antibody test, but not getting RNA testing, people getting lost to follow up, a longer time for diagnosis. It also missed early HCV infections for those who uh, were just recently infected and didn't have positive antibody at the time of testing. And then, of course, there was no point of care diagnosis. And this resulted in not a lot of people moving along that cascade of care towards cure. Next slide. So. Um, this was great. Like we we got to this point and we celebrated. We did it. But then next slide. There were just so many questions that came after that. Like, what does CDC guidance say about this point of care testing? Who would benefit most from this kind of testing? Where should we put these machines? Who should we test? Like, should I use the single step approach um, or should I kind of stick with the antibody first approach? And then what do I do with positive results? How do I get those folks treated? Next slide. So. Um, we thought about to answer a lot of these questions. One of the first questions was, uh, what does CDC say about this? So here's a snapshot of our 2013 guidance on HCV testing and our algorithm. And here, there was nothing here that clearly or uh, stated anything about single step RNA testing or point of care testing. Next slide. But we went back and we dug through all the fine print of that guidance, just like, how do we find a way to green light this? Because we don't want to have to wait a year and a half for um, a, a guidelines development process to come up and tell us what we already know is rather evident. But we found it out. We looked at some of the fine text and the footnotes, and we saw that among those who had been exposed to HCV within the last six months, we had texts that said, actually, you know, you can go ahead and straight and test those folks for HCV RNA, because again, that might be in that early infection period. And so we were able to quickly turn that around and get some language on our website saying very clearly that HCV RNA testing is currently recommended for the diagnosis of HCV infection among persons who might have been exposed to HCV within the last six months. And this is regardless of antibody testing. Next slide. Great. The next question was, what about the single step versus two step testing approach? Uh, a lot of benefits for the single step one, but also a lot of benefits for the two step approach, um, as you see in this nice image that Cepheid had developed. Next slide. And so we started thinking, all right, how do we create a framework for understanding what are the approaches we should use? So the first part, you know, the upper left corner was um, laboratory two-step antibody to RNA testing. That's that's what we've been dealing with, what we have has some benefits, certainly some downsides. Next slide, or next, yep, thank you. Um, but with this new test, it opens up an entire point of care testing option. So we could still do point of care antibody to point of care RNA testing. The benefits to that, obviously, it's all entirely point of care. You don't need any phlebotomy or laboratory access. And you can get all those results within the same encounter. A challenge here is that it still misses those early HCV infections. And then, of course, the added uh, challenge of getting this a little bit more complex point of care test set up in some of the high impact settings. And it may be more expensive than laboratory approaches, depending, not always. Next slide or next step. Yep. There was also this you know, lab-based single-step HCV RNA approach, which I guess has been around, but is technically off-label and isn't used that much, but next advanced one. But really, kind of, there's this new single-step point-of-care HCV RNA approach. So similar to the point-of-care two-step approach, all that benefit of um, finger stick testing with the added uh, benefit of being able to detect early HCV infections. A challenging here might be is um, if, depending on the prevalence of the population, that might end up being a more expensive process to um, get to your diagnoses. And then depending on the intensity or the volume that you're testing, you may run into some rate limiting steps. Next slide. <coughs> so um, the, then we thought about what, who would benefit the most from point of care testing? And then where should we be setting up point of care testing capacity? And we boiled it down to a couple setting characteristics that we thought would be helpful for um, 
deciding what type of testing to do. The first is hepatitis C prevalence. If you're in a high prevalence setting, that might favor a single step HCV RNA approach. For the encounter type, if you've got a brief encounter setting, such as like you're only gonna be able to reach these folks within a limited period of time, that's gonna favor a point of care test approach to get that result really quickly. Uh, phlebotomy and lab access, obviously if you don't have it, that's gonna favor a point of care approach, but if you do have it, you can choose between the two. And then lastly, client volume. I think point of care HCV RNA testing can get really challenging if you're in very high intensity testing campaigns, just due to the nature of there's only so many modules within the machine to test at any given time. And then if it's a really low uh, volume testing setting, you have to ask yourself if it's worth doing that investment in order to um, set up the machine and do do all the testing for a smaller population. Next slide. So what we came up with was uh, these potential testing strategies. So these aren't recommendations. These are considerations that you can think about, see if it's right for you. Um, but in settings that had the highest prevalence, so these are places caring for like people who inject drugs. So that would be your syringe service programs, opioid treatment programs, or outpatient medication assisted treatments. Here, the prevalence of HCV is um, gonna be pretty high. And so um, doing a viral first approach to ensure you're not missing any um, early HCV infections and that you're able to um, get all of that test results within the same encounter has, has some benefits. Um, for additionally high uh, prevalence settings, carceral places are a place we're particularly interested. Now here, the prevalence is not quite as high as some of these other settings, but high nonetheless that depending on what part of the country you're in, you may wanna consider a single step approach if you have a very high prevalence. Um, for prisons, a lot of those places will have integrated infectious disease screening on intake already in place. So it may not make as much sense to add a point of care component to it, but for large jails where you've got a limited amount of time to diagnose someone, start them on treatment, um, we see a lot of potential benefit um, in these sort of settings. Next slide. Um, and then for settings that have low to moderate prevalence settings, here maybe that two-step uh, uh, approach to testing might be more preferable. So that could be like in emergency departments or urgent care, STI clinics, primary care settings, remote settings, or maybe even pharmacies. Um, here that two-step approach may be beneficial. And then depending on the nature of the, if that's a brief encounter, do you have access to laboratory uh, and phlebotomy, that can help kind of shift you towards whether that's um, a laboratory or a point of care based approach. Next slide. So then the last question was, how do I pair point of care testing with treatment? And there are a lot of great models and pioneers in this. The Combi Clinic was a great example that Jen just gave. Um, I think uh, usually you kind of boil it down to maybe one of four different modalities. The first is co-located treatment. Go ahead and do one click. And that's a good strategy for ensuring that, you know, you get that diagnosis, there's someone there to be able to then shepherd you into treatment. The challenge with that is that um, for these non-clinical settings where we need to scale up the most, you may not have the capacity to co-locate care. Go ahead, give it a click. Um, telehealth. Uh, is sort of an emerging option. So places that maybe don't have the capacity to co-locate may be able to interface and get people on the um, computer or screen or telephone with a provider that can then prescribe hepatitis C treatment with point of care test results. Next slide or next click. And then there's also the mobile unit example where we can take mobile units, set up everything we need as a one-stop shop, and either bring those uh, testing and treatment capacities to sort of brick and mortar locations or even do community outreach. And then the last one is patient navigation. Here's where I don't really have a readily able ability to pair you, but maybe I can do some more warm handoffs, more aggressive patient follow-up and linking to care. Um, all of these, you know, we wanna make sure that we're not building bridges to nowhere. We wanna ultimately get these people treated. Next slide. And so uh, all of summing all that up, we're really excited about this new technology. We'd love to see it scale up in syringe service programs, large jails, opioid treatment programs, and mobile clinics in particular. Um, and so I think this helps bring us one step closer to elimination. Next slide. And then this is just to say that um, earlier last week, we, or no, this week, we um, published our um, hepatitis C point of care testing considerations document that details a lot of what I just covered. 
um, that can be uh, available for you all to read if you're you're curious and you um, want to think more about how might I implement this and, and if it's right for me. Next.